Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. Can I just check that everyone can hear me? Okay, if you just use the chat box to tell me if you can hear me, that'd be great. Can I just check that everyone can hear me okay? Perfect. I was getting a little worried that no one could hear us. <laughs> okay, so um, welcome to the Show Me The Money GDPR and Accounting um, webinar. We will be talking to you for half an hour, at which point we will then hand over to you for any questions that you may have um, to us. So I'm going to have this as a conversational webinar. I've got some slides. Graham will interject in his experience from um, Inca Accountants. Um, and then as I go along, think of your questions and we'll come back to them at the end of the webinar. It is being recorded, so it will be available to you next week. So um, if there's anything that you didn't catch, you can um, listen to it again uh, in the future. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Graham Carson, who's kindly agreed to co-host with me today. So Graham, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, D. Kelly. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Graham. I'm one of the uh, owners uh, of a multi-award winning accountancy practice uh, based here in Oxfordshire uh, called Inca um, that I co-own uh, with my good lady wife, Leslie. Um, and for the avoidance of any doubt, she's the clever one uh, and the much more important one in the business. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and my name's Kelly. I'm the co-founder um, of uh, DataBasics. So, what I want to do is I want to uh, briefly just do a quick review of uh, GDPR and then we'll get into the, the main uh, meat of the webinar. So just a, a reminder, the um, regulation came into effect just over a year ago. It came into domestic law at the same time. So we talk about the general data protection regulation, but it is also in domestic law as the Data Protection Act of 2018. It applies to every organization that is based in the EU. So everyone on this webinar, if you are based in the EU, it applies to you. If you are buying goods and services from organizations that are not based in the UK or EU, say for example, in Australia or the US, they have to adhere to it because they are working with you as their client. And if any organization monitors behavior, so if you think of the likes of Strava, Fitbit, for example, or the advertising industry that monitors people's behavior, they of EU residents, they also have to adhere. This webinar is going to talk about controllers and processes because um, a lot of accountants act as processes on behalf of their clients. And it's important that there is an awareness of their responsibilities. It's not just you as the controller. Who has a responsibility and i'm also going to talk about the fact that regardless of the size of the organization data protection applies to you whether you are large or small and i will definitely talk um, about when i come to mapping which is the next slide we'll talk about the impact of um, brexit so one of the conversations that Graham and I had when we first agreed to do the webinar is to talk about the flow of finance information. Um, naively, I thought it was quite easy, um, but Graham educated me to say just how complex it is. So Graham, would you like to share um, your experience of how an accountant record gets to you? Indeed, Kelly, thank you. So, um, so perhaps it's best to illustrate by uh, some practical uh, uses of uh, of personal data um and one of those uh, potentially to start with is uh, is something very simplistic like payroll um so we have personal information uh, about an individual employee their uh, their name uh, date of birth uh, gender um, their national insurance number their home address and um, and potentially even for um, for some employers uh, they may well uh, also have uh, bank details um, in order to uh, make an electronic uh, banking transfer of their net pay so in respect of um, that information flow um, clearly that's provided by the um, employee to the employer um, but we run payroll for around about 140 of our um, clients uh, large and small so of course that information is then transferred across to us um, 
that's processed uh, within our um, payroll systems. Um, we have uh, details then that need to be transferred back to the employer, uh, not least of which are the uh, are the pay slips of the individuals themselves, um, so that they can be uh, distributed. And um, and either that goes in uh, a single batch to the employer, or they get sent individually to the employee. Um, of course, that's one uh, part of the process. But we then have the next stage of that, which introduces Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, because they want to know on a monthly basis about what information has been processed, um, how much tax and national insurance has been deducted from those employees, and of course, for that to be then uh, paid across. Um, if an employee leaves, um, there's a P45 uh, that is created, which again contains uh, large degrees of personal data, um, which is provided uh, both through the employer back to the employee so that it can be then given to the next uh, employer along. So that's just one example. If we then talk about um, dealing with a set of financial accounts, um, so we then have um, information which is being uh, kept, uh, which is uh, the details of our clients customers um, they might be private individuals um, that may well be stored within an accounting piece of software um, which is certainly more and more the case or historically um, on spreadsheets um, passed to us um, along with actual bank statements um, related to that business and of course uh, we are then processing that in order to determine um, a set of statutory accounts um, or a business um, tax arrangement. And if it happens to be a, uh, a self-employed person, um, then that's ultimately going to be fed through into their self-assessment tax return, from which, of course, we're going to collect a number of other items of information, such as personal bank accounts, um, national insurance numbers, again, details of shareholdings, um, all sorts of stuff that they might do, including if they're making charitable donations, how much and to which charities. So there's a, a massive amount of data that is passed between um, the actual individual, either directly to us because that individual is business um, or through their employer if they happen to be an employee. So for me, from a data protection perspective, and one of the things that the GDPR asked organisations to do was to map that data flow, so really understand where the data starts from and where it ends up. And that's very important when it's talking about transparency. So if an employee was to ask um, a uh, an employer who works with Inca, they would have the right to know that their information is shared uh, with Inca um, and then on to the HMRC. So one of the things to think about in your business is what's the flow of the finance information. If it's just from you to the accountant, it's quite a small flow, but there will be a flow of information. Unless, of course, you do everything and you do maintain your spreadsheet, you contact and are liaising with the HMRC. But in many instances, there is a flow of data from um, an individual through multiple um, organizations. So please think about that flow um, of data. Now, from a Brexit perspective, that's even more important because if, for example, Inca was working on behalf of a European company and they were processing the employee records of the European um, entity, the flow of information from Europe to the UK, if we leave with a no deal, stops unless there is a contract in place between the a European employer and um, Inca here in the UK. Because from a Brexit perspective, if we leave with a no deal, we are essentially um, a third country um, and we need to make sure that uh, the flow of data continues and that's done by contract. If we leave with a deal, and that entirely depends on who takes over the leadership, if we leave with a deal, we've got two years to manage that process. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was about um, accountants will um, have a number of different software um, products, potentially. Some are affiliated with just one. They will have different software accounting packages that they are looking to promote um, to engage their clients and move them from Excel spreadsheets into a digital um, format, which is the push of making tax digital. So I just wanted to um, ask Graham about the impact of 
you know, what are they being asked from a client's perspective about the product, say, for example, QuickBooks or um, Zero? How compliant are you being asked how compliant these systems are? Um, in the last 12 months, we've only had one situation where a, a customer has, uh, has spoken to us and we ha we've engaged in a conversation and we needed to get the actual software company um, directly involved uh, within that. Um, in our case, um, it might be a little bit different perhaps from uh, from other accounting mm -hmm. practices. Um, in the, the conversation that we have with the uh, our customer is all about their needs, what they're uh, uh, required to do. Um, so making tax digital, um, which is very much the flavor at the moment, mm -hmm. is actually requiring the use of technology um, above and beyond uh, the simple spreadsheet or the, uh, the ledger book. Um, but ultimately, in our case, it's the customer who will make the decision as to which piece of software that they wish to uh, to utilize. Now, one of the things that we're able to do, as as in fact is uh, any firm of accountants, um, uh, where they're working with uh, some of the major software um, companies, uh, the likes of QuickBooks, of Xero, et cetera, um, Sage, um, there are discounts which are available to accountants um, which after perhaps an initial introductory period are not available to um, individual businesses in their own right. And so therefore it can be advantageous uh, economically for a business owner to um, take a subscription through the accountant for the software to simply lower their day-to-day uh, -day running costs. Um, the, uh, the obvious thing that uh, uh, that then um, creates is, uh, well, okay, has a responsibility passed um, to the accountant um, from the business owner because the actual software is being um, invoiced on a subscription basis uh, through the accounting practice. And, and, um, and, and, and you know, our view is that the, the ultimate choices come from the, uh, from the customer um, and the, the, the primary relationship is between the customer and the software provider directly. Um, and we're simply facilitating them getting access to a discount, almost like a, a disbursement scenario would be in, uh, in, in a legal uh, environment. Um, and I would absolutely support that. So if you are um, looking with your accountant for a software package to move towards making tax digital or you've done that already, you as the business owner or the business are responsible for the decision about what system you take on as the controller, you have that responsibility. You can work with um, your accountant in terms of the uh, them being the processor to ask the questions. Um, of the software, like Graham suggested, um, the reality is though that you as the organization should be checking out the how robust that organization is um, and how they would respond to um, a breach because they are still processing your information uh, on your behalf. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we come on to the breach section um, of this because it is an important thing to realize where where does accountability fit um, in a breach um, scenario so for you please when you're being asked to move to a new software system remember it's your responsibility to consider which product works best for you and your business in fact, Kelly, I, I'd like to throw yeah. in a question in respect to this myself, because one of the real benefits to the business owner of the use of um, the, the uh, software uh, from an accountancy perspective at the moment is, is the anytime, anywhere usage of it, because it's all browser based. Yeah. And of course, the more people are traveling um, and, uh, and arriving at coffee shops um, yeah. or arriving uh, at international locations with hotel Wi-Fi and logging in on um, what would be, uh, generally speaking, uh, considered to be insecure networks yeah. um, and then accessing their financial accountancy um, information, mm -hmm. I, I'd be interested in some of the, uh, the additional risks, particularly where that's outside or inside the EU that uh, the business owner would be addressing. That's a really good question. So from the perspective of where physically the data is stored in the accountant uh, software system, you need to ask the question of the software supplier. Physically, where is my data? Is it outside of Europe? If so, where? So if it's in the United States, which is where the majority of zero servers are, you'd want an assurance that zero adhere to European law. And they do that by signing up to what is referred to as Privacy Shield. In terms of the business owner, um, you're absolutely right. I, I see a lot of people working from cafes, from um, hotel reception areas. And for me, I always recommend if you're going to be 
accessing personal data or personal sensitive data, do it over a secure connection. So never do it over a public Wi-Fi because you can't be confident of how secure that public Wi-Fi um, is. You can get dongles from your um, your telephone provider that will give you a secure connection. Um, and if you have um, outsourced IT, they can also create a secure tunnel from you to that software package. But I certainly wouldn't be accessing any of my accounting um, from public Wi-Fi, exactly. but I know it happens. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so the next thing I really wanted um, to talk about is the some of the risks. So we've just kind of touched on that on the previous slide is that you as the um, organization have a responsibility to identify um, the risks. So you should be doing the proper due diligence and um, things such as where physically is your finance data going to be stored. So when you map in your information, you know it's coming from a client to you, for example, it's then going to your accountant. How is it going to your accountant? Is that via an email? Is it going via the post? Is it going via Dropbox, for example? And then where's the data physically being stored in terms of the accountancy system? Is it the States? Is it Australia? Is it some random uh, island in the middle of nowhere that has no security? So think about the potential risks. But I'd also want you to consider we never go into a business relationship thinking it's going to end badly. But I want you to think about if your accountant is setting up your system, do you have administrative rights over that system? Because if you don't and that relationship breaks down, you may no longer have access to your information, which is vital for you to run your business. So do understand the different types um, of risk and, and Graham and I we had a brief conversation before the webinar about transferring clients from one accountancy practice to another and that software system migration is part of that transfer. Uh, 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 very much the case and uh, but as, as well as that um, you know, there are fundamental requirements that accountants have to go through which which, which make this um, risks and, and on the transfer of data um, even more important See, we have to undertake an ID verification on every client that we take on board. And it's not just us. That's any accountant in practice. And um, this is for anti-money laundering mm -hmm. purposes. Um, it surprises me the number of um, individuals who are quite happy to take a picture of the um, passport photo page and simply ping it across on an email. Um, and... I would be horrified if accountants were, or anyone else for that matter, you know, of a similar nature, were actually encouraging or asking for someone to do that. Um, we utilize a secure portal, and and whilst it's it's a pain from the customer's perspective, it's not nice. But we explain to them, no, we we, we don't want you sending this this information through an open network and through yeah. you know through the likes of email. Please send it through our portal. We can then pick up the information, undertake that, because they could be sending us um, bank statements, um, passport uh, information, driving license information. They could be sending um, utility bills, you know, anything that anyone could love to get hold of in order to be able to um, to steal their identity. Um, we don't want that information being sent across through open networks. And, mm -hmm. and if they're uh, self-employed, for example, um, then their bank account is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So we don't want bank statements coming through just by way of PDF attachments yeah. on an email. Um, so the software and the, and the controlling uh, aspect of it is, is vitally important, but there are also um, some you know, equally fundamental and, and just very simple steps that business owners seem to take and they're very very willing to just throw all this personal data out on an email um mm. and it's like no, no no we have to not only not do that but to demonstrate to them that we're actually you know discouraging them from sending us any kind of sensitive yeah. information of that nature and i've noticed more so in the last 18 months is clients telling me they're sending that information via whatsapp so it's not the email anymore. They're taking right. a picture of the passport and they're like, I'll just do it here and I'll send it to you yeah. because it's encrypted and it's fine. And to me, the risks are the same. It's yeah. like, 
don't do it, I'll provide you with access to a secure location for you to upload to right. me, but please don't send it because it's perceived to be um, encrypted. And I, I try not to go gray when someone tells me <laughs> they're sending that level of information via WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or text message. Yes. Like, just just don't do yeah, it, please. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> so be mindful um, of the risks. And if you're not sure what they are, you know, obviously, we've hopefully this webinar is useful for you, but have conversations with your accountant about what the potential risks are and what you should be doing to reduce those risks. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, your privacy notices. Now, part of the regulation last year was about being transparent. And one of the ways to demonstrate transparency was through um, an updated privacy notice. Now, you probably got bombarded with updates to privacy notices the week before the 25th of May, because everyone was like, here's our updated privacy policy. Um, so it became quite overwhelming. But what you should be thinking about is, when your clients or your customers are landed on your website, what are you going to tell them about the information that you hold on them? Um, what are you telling your staff about the information that you hold on them when they are employed by you? And very importantly, as part of that transparency, making them aware that you do share information with third parties, such as accountants, for example. So if you haven't updated your privacy notice in the last 12 months, um, there is. Um, some checklists that are available um, on the ICO website. There are um, some guidance that we can provide, but do think about the importance of that. But when you are taking on an accountant, hopefully your accountant is through their engagement letter is telling you how they process um, your information and who they would share it with, for example, the HMRC. Um, and my question really to Graham is how many of your clients, or did they ask you, about your practices to help them update their privacy yeah, my, um, So my, my recollection uh, was, and we, we work with um, over 500 um, clients. Um, three um, of the 500 um, came to us um, as, as, as the processor of their data um, to ask us for, uh, you know, for a bit more of an explanation and, uh, and some, for copies of some of the policies uh, that that related to. Um, the, and, and, and we were able to, uh, to understand that um, because you know, we had gone through this this kind of process. Um, every single one of our uh, employees uh, undertook uh, GDPR mm -hmm. um, awareness training. Um, we had gone through and spent a very significant amount of time mapping um, the processes within uh, within Inca, um, not just from the point of view of where we were handling um, client information um, and the information of the employees of clients, but also um, in respect of ourselves, uh, recruitment, mm -hmm. um, and all of the former employees, all the bits that that related to that, and um, and how that all put together. But Every new member of the team who comes on board, it's part of their uh, basic induction process is to actually have that GDPR awareness training um, that is conducted. And, and we get to uh, we get a report um, on uh, on how well they scored. <laughs> Excellent. So really for yourselves, you know, if you haven't reviewed your privacy notice on your website or your staff or your recruitment privacy policies, I would once you've mapped your data, consider updating them in particular what you process and why you process that information they have the right to know as do you um, for any organization that's processing your information so it helps demonstrate um, transparency so one of the questions that we've had is about um, where does the software provider fall in this uh, in terms of a breach so every organization needs to be prepared for a potential breach now most breaches happen because an email gets sent to the wrong person. 50% almost of all breaches are because of inadvertent disclosure. But it's not just about disclosure. It is about security breaches. It is about systems being hacked. Most systems and accountancy systems are um, quite a, a, a target for um, hackers because of just the sheer amount of information that they would hold um, happen on a Thursday or a Friday. 
So the question would be, if your software provider, and I've got an example on the next slide, if your software supplier was to be the cause of the breach, so they have been hacked, they are responsible, one, for letting you know that it's happened, because you then need to um, evaluate just how many people have been affected by your use of that system and whether or not you have to notify those individuals of that breach and whether or not you as the controller need to notify the information commissioner. The software supply, if they are found to be at fault because they've not updated a, a software patch, for example, or they've had a member of staff um, access information they shouldn't have, they are liable for that and they will get uh, penalised for that um, by the information commissioner, whether that be a penalty notice or whether it be an audit. Um, However, if you are the cause of the breach, so um, you have your staff accessing your accountancy pa uh, package and you've given everybody full access to your accountancy package and they download information they shouldn't or they send information to someone they shouldn't, that's not the software supplier's issue. That is an issue that resides within your organisation and then you are responsible for, again, reporting that to the information commissioner if it's significant and dealing with any of the repercussions um, of that. For example, you um, didn't put appropriate measures in place to reduce who should have access um, to your system. So the question has got to be when a breach happens is, where did it start? You know, was it at the software supplier's end? Was it at your end? Was it through the accountant? Understand that as quickly as possible and then assess whether or not you need to report that um, to the information commissioner. And the reason I talk about internal breaches is because Sage, a couple of years ago, had a rogue member of staff that was arrested um, because they accessed two to 300 uh, accounts within the Sage software system um, of UK businesses um, for no other reason than the fact that they wanted to access um, the data. And they, whilst they had the privilege to access it, they were um, had no right to view that information at that time. So um, Sage were investigated for that and they then contacted each of their customers affected to say, this is what happened and how you've been affected. So that is what I would expect um, to happen. And the conversation that Graham and I had before the webinar was we would hope that if one of the software suppliers was to be breached and they were the cause of the breach, that they would tell the customer as well as the accountant. So they are aware, both parties are aware that the breach has happened and then um, appropriate measures um, can be put in place. Yeah, great, absolutely. So then, because I'm quite conscious um, of time, I wanted to um, just make you aware of some of the things to think about as an organization. So Graham's talked about some of the stuff that he's gone through um, last year in terms of demonstrating compliance with the regulation. So what are you doing on a regular basis? You may only be a small organization, but what data protection reviews do you conduct? So a simple thing, and something that the information commissioner is um, very much investigating at the moment, is whether or not you've paid your data protection fee. If you don't know, if you should have um, registered, the next slide will tell you the link that you need to click. If you should have registered, pay the fee, it's £40. You could be fined up to £4,000 for not complying with that. And if you don't need to pay the fee, you uh, can rest and but still apply, adhere to the regulation, but don't worry about paying the £40 fee. Graham's talked about making sure that staff are trained and through training, you're identifying requests for access to information. You may think that you don't want to train everybody, but give them basic awareness training because staff and individuals are by far your biggest weakness when it comes to data protection. And so if you train them, then at least they've got an awareness. And then maybe from a management perspective, you may want to give a more detailed training, um, in particular, how to handle a subject access request. For example, and, and Graham, you talked about everyone being given um, awareness training and then having that renewed on an annual basis. Yes, that's right. So, um, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, so this time last year, um, we did uh, two things, uh, GDPR uh, awareness training for everyone and also uh, general security um, awareness training. 
Uh, and then since then, every new member of the team that's come in has had both of those bits of training as part of their uh, first week of induction. Um, the other thing that uh, we've undertaken is we've subscribed to a service which will um, send um, spurious uh, 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 emails uh, to uh, members of the team, um, which are really purporting to appear to be genuine, um, but the, the, the typical things that they might experience in a real um, scenario. Um, what happens is if they inadvertently um, you know, click on something that uh, we, we, we were trying to um, educate them not to, um, it will just take them to a, uh, to a website page that just explains a little bit about what's there. And then we can reinforce that with further training um, associated with that particular aspect um, of the uh, of the area that they you know they yeah. need to take a look at. And bear in mind, we um, fifty percent of all breaches are related to disclosure. I think something as simple as that could be a very useful uh, practical tool to have is just to check if people are um, routinely clicking the link and whether or not they need more education. Absolutely um, on it. <clears throat> and at the um, Coming back to one of the, the points I mentioned um, earlier it, it, uh, about payroll and about um, personal tax, um, what we tried to do is to anticipate as many of the human error scenarios and, mm -hmm. and therefore put um, processes in place. So, for example, when uh, when pay slips uh, are sent, um, the, uh, our pay slips are generated. They're um, they're PDFs. Mm -hmm. um, they get sent out to our customers, whether that's the actual employee or uh, the employer um, with a uh, password that is uh, shared between us and the employer or, or uh, employee. Um, similarly, uh, now we, with that, with that um, if it's going to an employee, we have the ability to only send the payslips directly to that um, as a uh, employee as opposed to um, attaching them to an email. Uh, the same is true with regards to tax returns, where it is uniquely password protected uh, with something which is mm -hmm. shared and agreed by uh, by us and the uh, and the client. Um, because it's it's so easy, and you know, being very open about it, we we had a near miss mm -hmm. in respect of um, some payroll information that was accidentally sent to employer uh, A and uh, we should have gone to employer B. Mm -hmm. um, now, fortunately, um, it was recalled before anything was a seen, and even if it had been open, they wouldn't have been able to view it because mm -hmm. it was all protected. But but it's it's recognizing that we make mistakes, yeah. and 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 therefore trying to understand understand what additional measures we can put in place to help to overcome um, these kind of scenarios so that when a mistake does happen, which it will, it's not a major problem from yeah. a GDPR perspective. I agree. And it's that I've made a mistake, Graham, what do we do? Yeah. So you're not taken by um, surprise. And I, I think that's absolutely um, true. It's and, it, you know, think about if your accountants are sending you information just via email or if you've got similar facilities in place to be able to send information more um, securely. And knowing that your staff are aware that that's your processes, I think, is important. Um, this is the brief slide that says if you think you need to pay a data protection fee, um, this is the link that you should be clicking. Um, and obviously, you'll have access to the webinar um, from Tuesday should you need to look um, at the link. It takes no more than five minutes and it will tell you yes or no. Um, if you do have to pay the fee, just pay it. Um, it's 40 pounds and potentially could save you 4,000 pounds. So in, in summary, um, you know, it's about making sure, now I've said it clients, it's making sure that individuals are well informed uh, and are always being provided with clear and transparent information. So on your employees, you want to be very clear with them that they know that their information is being processed by an accountant on your behalf. If you are an accountancy practice, it's about making sure you're telling your clients how you um, process their information. Um, in terms of digital accounting, make sure that you are clear of its capabilities, both from an accounting perspective, as well as from a data protection, because they do go hand in hand. And you as the business owner or the um, decision maker within the business make that choice don't just make it because you're being told this is the right system you base it on a is it meeting your needs as a business does it meet your data re uh, protection responsibilities um and unfortunately i see it a lot but don't dismiss uh, gdpr i know it could be quite overwhelming um but it is something that we all have to adhere to and think about not about 
financial penalties. Think about the impact on your reputation should something go awry and you've done um, little to nothing about it as a regulation because you assumed it would never happen um, to you. Is there um, anything else you'd like to add to that in terms of uh, your experience, Graham? I, I think that, um, that there's a, you know, it, it's a massive area. And, and and I know from our own experience of when we were really looking into this, um, that I found um, navigating through the information on the uh, Information Commissioner's Office uh, website very difficult. It was almost like I needed to know what I needed to know in order to be able to understand what it was that they were telling me that I needed to do. Um, so it wasn't easy. And, 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 it, and in situations like that where business owners are you know, incredibly challenged and there's so many things that are, that are happening um, with their business on any given uh, day of the week that um, you know, quite a lot of them, um, if not a, an overwhelming majority, are, are, you know, could be forgiven operationally for the fact that they tend to um, focus on other priorities. Um, but yeah, these things do have the uh, you know the potential to um, to cause uh, you know major problems, um, and um, and and at least asking some questions and coming to you know experts like your, yourselves to, uh, to to find out a little bit about what they do. At yeah. least they can start a journey, and at least they can start to um, put some measures in place um, in order to protect them as best they can. Excellent. So now it's really over to you. Um, do you have any questions for us? We've obviously had a question um, about Brexit. We've had a question about um, software suppliers. We've got a few minutes to um, answer any questions um, that you may have, um, which we are. Um... Yes, yes. So um, the, the uh, comment that's been made is about uh, this week, the information commissioner has been found to um, be non-compliant of the regulation themselves in that their cookie policy um, wasn't actually compliant with the law. Um, to be fair, they have owned up to it, but it is a little bit of a, a, an own goal, um, to be perfectly frank. Um, and it's a bit unfortunate, um, but it does show that it can happen uh, to just about anybody. Um, and at least they were transparent. I know they've had a lot of egg on their face, unfortunately, about it, um, but they did put a hand up. But it just goes to prove that you should check what you're putting on your policies. And if you have used the information commissioner's privacy slash cookie policy, you might want to go back and revisit um, that for your own um, purposes. Oh, OK, so um, the next question we have is about extent of insurance essential for a micro business. Um, so there are, I think, from a data protection perspective, um, I think the big product that's coming onto the market now is cyber insurance. Um, if you are going to um, look at cyber insurance, we did a webinar on data protection and cyber insurance that you may want to um, listen to because a lot of people think that their um, liability they've taken out from their business insurance covers them from a data protection perspective. And actually, in many instances, it doesn't. Um, so do take... Um, do look at whether or not you need cyber insurance. And then you can have a conversation with a broker. They will ask you about what you've done about data protection. And as with anything, your premium will be based on how much work you've done to be um, compliant. Um, I can, um, if you're interested and you want an introduction to any uh, cyber insurance brokers that we work with, I'm more than happy to give that introduction. And if you want um, any discounts, so anyone that's listening to this, if you are interested in cyber insurance, there's a couple of brokers that we work with that we're happy to recommend um, that you get um, quotes um, for. Um, are there any other um, questions that we have? I do like an engaged audience. So uh, as many questions as you uh, are happy to provide us with, it's always, uh, it's always good. What I'd also um, like to ask now is, um, is it obviously there's absolutely no obligation and I don't want you to feel that there is, but if you'd like any additional follow up with either Graham or myself from this call, if you could just indicate in the text box whether or not you'd like a follow up call with Graham or myself, then um, we'll happily uh, book that in. If you don't, honestly, don't worry about it. We're, we won't be offended. Um, 
uh, by that. Um, good question that we've just had is how much responsibility falls on the franchisor for its franchisee? Now, each franchisee is a business in its own right. Um, so it will be a data controller. If it's processing information on behalf of the franchise also, it's also technically classed as a processor. There would need to be an agreement between the uh, franchisor and the franchisee, which typically is covered within the franchisee um, agreement um, and within the operational manual in terms of where does liability um, sit. But there should be um, something in the uh, contract which should have been updated for everybody. Um, and certainly, as a franchisee, you do have to be responsible for data protection because you're a business in your own right. Um, but if the franchisor is at fault, then obviously liability would sit um, with them. Um, in terms of uh, whether or not who owns the software, it's very much like we've talked about from an accountancy uh, perspective. Um, if a breach happens, for example, with um, a CRM system or with a, um, an accountancy package, um, if the fault is because of the software provider, they are um, they are where liability is. If it's because the, the um, parent organization, or in this instance, the franchisor, has not done appropriate risk assessment of that system, um, and the breach happens because of that lack of risk assessment, the fault will lie potentially with the franchisor. If the franchisee or the client is downloading information or using it inappropriately that leads to a breach, the breach and the liability then sits with the client or the franchisee. So it's really about risk assessment and um, responsibility and accountability. Um, cool. So um, I'd like to just um, thank Graham. And do you want to do a quick 60 second uh, pitch about uh, the awesomeness of Inca? <laughs> That's very kind. Um, the awesomeness of Inca. <clears throat> um, so my wife and I have been running the uh, the business. We're, uh, what are we, 13 people? Um, and we've been uh, running it going back to 2002. Um, our specialism is working with service-based experts um, who are um, Oxfordshire and, uh, and Berkshire located, um, and in particular those who are just getting going. Um, you know, it's a, a horrendous uh, statistic, um, depending on, on which one you look at. But the one that most people tend to um, focus in on um, is that only 20% of businesses uh, make it successfully to their fifth birthday, which is an absolutely appalling um, statistic. Um, our clients have now managed to um, to get that to 63.9%. Uh, wow. Um, so, yeah, that's that's pretty good. And that comes from having good conversations with them, uh, but also helping them to, um, to 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 understand more about the uh, the skills that need to be acquired in um, in actually running uh, a business as opposed to just leaving them to get on and do the job that they're yeah. already good at. Um, uh, there's a question that's come in about software that we recommend to our clients. So just to clarify, we don't actually recommend um, the, the, the software itself. Uh, there are a number of um, pieces of software for which we are certified as um, as partners. Um, we have, uh, and these are ones whereby if a customer is working uh, and wants us to do day-to-day -day, um, bookkeeping, then we're going to put them onto, um, onto one of uh, those systems. And they tend to be um, Xero, um, QuickBooks Online, or um, a product called Clear uh, Books. But as far as uh, a, a client's choice, if, if a client wants to um, use a particular piece of software, then that's up to them. We might we might cringe um, a few times if they, and you sure you really want to use that? Um, and um, and in some cases, we might actually decline to um, to engage with them because of the software choice that uh, they might okay. want to make. But at the end of the day, it's their business. It's not our business yeah. to um, you know to tell them what to do. Um, it's better to have a conversation with them about what they want to achieve with uh, their record keeping yeah. and how to make that record keeping efficient and um, and the processing of that uh, to be uh, to be you know um, a, a way of doing things um, yeah. so um, as far as uh, you know individual bits of software are concerned um, you know there's lots of good things um, anyone who is making a choice I, I would be asking questions such as um, is it uh, compliant with making tax digital um, do I have access to it in a variety of locations? Am I penalized on the base of the number of uh, users who mm -hmm. get access uh, to it? Um, but what about the operational efficiency? Because um, 
processing paperwork is not a particularly um, exciting or fulfilling part of a business owner's day. And the last thing, in my opinion, that anyone wants to do is to be continually expanding their administrative overhead as their business grows. Yeah. So I tend to um, talk to customers about the idea of, so what can you do that will make this uh, process more efficient, that you can automate or semi-automate processes um, through the use of technology? And um, and certainly uh, uh, up till now, um, with integrated third-party applications to assist with um, operational efficiency and being able to add further functionality, um, Zero has been, in my opinion, um, the market leader in respect mm -hmm. of that. And, and more recently, um, QuickBooks has, uh, has also seen a number of things that are, uh, that are driving it. Um, other products um, such as uh, Sage, such as um, Free Agent, such as ClearBooks itself, which, which we use a lot of, um, have been quite uh, a bit slower to that third party integration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but ultimately, it's it's what the business owner needs to get out of their business, not what the accountant wants to get out of the business on their behalf. Excellent. Thanks, Graham. I am very conscious that we are at quarter two. So I'm going to do a mini few seconds about us. Um, if you do um, need or you're concerned about where you're sitting with data protection, whether it be policies, procedures or training, drop me a line. Um, we have this webinar and very other webinars that might be of interest to you. One was about cybersecurity. One was about handling breaches. Um, we've done a year review of GDPR. So please take a look um, at those. But as always, there's no obligation um, to um, engage with us. Should you want to, our contact details are on here. And anyone that has indicated they would like a um, follow-up call or email with uh, Graham, I will make sure that is uh, that takes place. But I'd like to thank you all very much for taking part. Um, it's been a very interactive session, so thank you for that. It makes it much more easier for us as presenters to have that engagement. Um, thank you, and enjoy the rest of your uh, Friday. So uh, I will sign off and uh, good day. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye for now from me.